I'm Ricky Miner, and you're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. Hi, everyone. John Liebman here. You're watching for BassPlayersOnly.com. We are here on location today with Ricky Miner in Hollywood, California, in Ricky's fabulous Red Lotus Studios. How you doing, Ricky? Good, man. It's such a, such a pleasure. You know, we've met each other for you know, several times throughout yeah. the years. This is the first time we've actually sat down together for an interview, and uh, I'm excited about it. Well, thanks for calling me, man. Well, I'm, I'm always happy to talk about the thing that we all love, which is music and bass. Yes, it is. Well, why don't we start from the beginning? I'd like to learn about your musical upbringing. You're, you were born in Louisiana. I know you spent yeah. most of your life in California, but what are those earliest memories you can recall of music in the house, maybe your parents, maybe brothers and sisters, instruments around the house, records playing. Yeah. Tell me about your musical upbringing. Well, as far as I know, like no one in my family plays music, plays an instrument. So, but I, what I remember was hearing music all the time. And uh, I just love music. I love the way it sounded. I love the way it made me feel. And so I just kind of gravitated to it. And the Jackson 5 came out. And all of the kids wanted to be the Jackson 5. I mean, who didn't right. uh, in terms of, of, of the kids? In my neighborhood, we had tons of groups that were emulating Jackson 5. Group. I sang Jermaine Jackson's part. And that's how I became a bass player, is that when, when, the, when the group needed to learn instruments because we didn't have a band, we sang along with the r recordings. And pretty soon, we were getting called for weddings and, and things like that and at 14. And uh, because people loved our, our routine, we had our dancing and singing, and we learned barbershop harmony. My uncle managed us, and he thought it's best if we really take singing lessons and not just kind of on our own device try to figure things out. And one of the things that they taught us was barbershop harmony. And so now you imagine these, these uh, four black kids from Watts singing barbershop harmony. And so that got a lot of attention, and people wanted us to do our routine, do the barbershop thing, and we put a little show together. But then we, my uncle said, look, you guys have to learn an instrument, you know, because uh, I'm having a hard time finding people who want to play behind, you know, little kids, you know, that, that aren't famous, they can't really pay them. So you need to learn an instrument. So I said, okay, well, I'll play bass. That's because I sing Jermaine's part. I can play it and sing. He's singing and playing the part. So... I'll play bass. Did you sing the bass part in the barbershop stuff too? No, no, I actually didn't. Yeah, I didn't. I uh, I sing the tenor part in the barbershop harmony, but you know, uh, that's how I play bass. Okay, so once you started playing bass and once you discovered the instrument, I would imagine you listened to the radio a little bit differently and maybe picked it out. Did you have any? Oh, absolutely. Musical I mean, influences, bass heroes. Bass? Well, well, that first year, um, I, I had a little transistor radio. And I would sit by it, and in those days, the same songs, the, 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 the playlist played over and over. So you just have to wait a little while, yeah. and, and Skin Tight would come on again, and, and, and all these uh, 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 Get Down Tonight, and all these other songs would come on the radio. And you just sit there and, 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 and try to pick out the parts. And the next thing I know, I had a book of 100 songs that I'd learned from the radio, just by sitting by the radio listening. And I, once I felt that I could play it from beginning to end, then I wrote it in my little tablet. And once I had 100 songs, I called my uncle and I said, hey, uh, I've been practicing my bass and uh, I'm going to put a band together. Will you manage the band? And he said, yeah. So I put the band together in high school and we, and we did all those weddings and proms and bar mitzvahs and and uh, every every little social gathering we could do, you know. How formal was your study of the bass? Did you take lessons? I took bass lessons, yeah. Okay. I took bass lessons, I took music lessons, uh, I took private lessons. I, I uh, <clears throat> sold, um, uh, I, I, I did uh, Coke bottles. And, and we would turn the Coke bottles at oh, yeah. five cents a Coke bottle, and I would sell enough bottles to have the money to take the bus and take, I call, I, I mean, I cold call. I, I got the yellow pages out and it said bass lessons and I called. And I took my bass and I took the bus and I would take a lesson. Whenever I had enough money, I would call and take a lesson. Did you play upright also in those days? I didn't play upright until I got to high school. And I got to high school and uh, I played one semester and then my, t my uh, top 40 band took off. I mean, we were booked every weekend, you know, in high school. 
and then you know when we had our summer we worked all the time. Well, that explains the uh, incredible head start you had in your career. It seems to me, you, you were what, about 19 when you got the gig with Gladys Knight? Yeah. And is that really the, the gig that, that yeah. put you on and, the map? Yeah, and it was Nathan East that, that recommended me for that gig. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I was playing in different bands and someone recommended Nathan East for me to take a lesson from. He just moved to town and he's a new guy in town and doing a lot of sessions and I took a lesson from him and he, he liked what I was doing. He said, hey, you sound good. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it. And then not long after that, he recommended me uh, to, he had me sub for him for a rehearsal for Hubert Laws he was working with. And so I went and did the rehearsal and he said, hey, I had a good report from you. He said, you did really well. And then not long after that, he and Freddie Washington started recommending me for different jobs. And uh, the first one was, was uh, Nathan for the Gladys gig. Okay, Nathan East, Freddie Washington, those are some heavy guys. And if they recommend you, you know, you got to yeah. be doing it. But from being a bass player and to moving up to being a musical director for acts like Whitney Houston and all the other stuff that you've done, how do you make, the, is it a leap or is it a transition? How do you get from A to B? Well, remember, you know, I. Remember, I started my band at 16, so I had, I had, you know, this uh, leadership skills. You know, I, I knew, I know how to how how to have a plan, form a team, and execute, and that's it. You know, I mean, it's, whether it's music or business, or doesn't age. matter what it is. Uh, so I think that that I knew I could do that. And then I worked with Whitney and uh, I met her when she was 18, I was 22. And- um, Tell me about her and tell me about that gig. Well, you know, I mean, it was a, an amazing opportunity. I mean, I was I was doing the Gladys gig and uh, I met the music director at the time, John Simmons. He was from New York and he played in her church. And he says, I got this girl sings in my church trying to get a record deal. And I'm coming to LA, will you put a band together? Uh, so I can do it with you and, and the guys you put together. And we did it, and no one showed up. None of the record companies showed up because at the time, it, there, there were groups. There were Shalimar, there were the Whispers, there were Parliament Funkadelic, it was all groups. And the Emotions and all these different groups. And uh, she was just a, a girl, a mic and a light, you know, just standing there. You know, and, and uh, so they weren't interested, but uh, she caught the attention of uh, Clive Davis and the rest is history. My musical director and my baby, Mr. Ricky Minor. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about American Idol. What, uh, how would you describe that experience? Because people see it on TV and they think whatever they think. What is, uh, what really goes on there? What would people be interested to know about behind the scenes and the position that uh, that you have held there. Uh, you know, tell us about that gig. Well, you know, the thing about, about that show, being a competition show, you're dealing with people who uh, some have never sang, uh, sang with a band before. You know, they, uh, Carrie Underwood was one. She just sang at home, never really sang in front of a band. Takes a lot of guts to, yeah. to come so, on a big show like so, that. With and then you have the cameras and the competition and people telling you you're you're not good or, or people giving you praise one time and the next person says you're not good and so there's a lot of lot of lessons learned. I learned a lot from guiding them, you know, about allowing people to be who they are and how they are and then support that. My job is simple. My job is to add value. That's it. I'm not, I, you know, and I say to the contestants, I'm not here to help you win. I'm not here to make you a star. I'm just here to add value and help you do better. How about a word about the Jay Leno gig and that experience? Man, you know, it has to be one of the best gigs in the world. I mean, our, you know, my, my, my guys came in, we've worked together so much and for so long, so, by the time I left, I mean, I was only at three years. We had over 1,500 songs in the book by the time I left. And my thought with the show was to keep the audience entertained and keep the energy up so that when Jay, uh, when we come back from commercial and it goes to Jay, the crowd has a lot of energy. So I wanted to stay away from anything that was mellow. You know, sure. I wanted the crowd to be excited. And so, and I picked a lot of songs where 
the you know the crowd either knew or could sing along and so we did everything from classic rock to uh um we did a lot of horn songs horn and fuse songs chicago earth wind and fire uh, eyes of march uh and uh and we did zeppelin no we, i have a, a since i went on out on my own back i did dream girls after gladys and i met the woman who was in charge of, of the music for that play and her name was diane uh, diane louis and she has been my music supervisor since 1983 wow. so we have a team of of arrangers and and i do some arrangements and we you know my thing is whoever's best for it that's who does it mm -hmm. 